everyone and welcome to this council meeting of the 6th of December, which is being live streamed and obviously being held online. I'm Lydia Wilson, Chair of Council, and I'd also like to introduce in turn my panel colleagues. Firstly, Ms Peter Duncan. Good evening, everybody. And Mr Chris Eddy. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, everyone. This is our last council meeting for the year and hopefully this is the last live stream meeting. We're really optimistic that come the new year, we'll be holding all of our council meetings in person. We really look forward to that with a live public gallery and the ability for residents to attend council meetings and actually ask their, ask their questions in person and also table their petitions and joint letters. So we're very much looking forward to that from the end of January, 2022. Uh, I'd now like to introduce our Chief Executive Officer, Mr Craig Lloyd, and ask that he introduces in turn the other members of the Executive Leadership Team who are in attendance this evening. Good evening and thank you, Chair. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our Executive Manager of Governance and Strategy, Mr Frank Joyce. Director of Community Wellbeing, Ms Kate McCackie. Actor, Acting Director of Corporate Services, Mr Mark Montague. Executive Manager, Public Affairs, Ms. Janine Morgan. Director of Planning and Development, Mr. Justin O'Mara. And a Director of in Infrastructure and Environment, Ms. Debbie Wood. Almighty God, we ask for your blessing upon this council to make informed and good decisions to the benefit of the people of the city of Whittlesea. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I now hand back over to the Chair of Council, Ms Lydia Wilson. Thank you, Mr Lloyd. And on behalf of the City of Whittlesea, I recognise the rich Aboriginal heritage of this country and I acknowledge the Wurundjeri Willem clan as the traditional owners of this place. And I'd also like to personally pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I note that all administrators are present at this council meeting. But before moving on to a general business of council, I would like to make a short acknowledgement. Uh, you might notice all of our virtual backgrounds. Uh, we'd like to formally recognise the fact that the United Nations International 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence, a global campaign that we're celebrating, is dedicated to ending violence against women and girls. It takes place each year between the 25th of November, which is International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, and the 10th of December, which is International Human Rights Day. And it's important to note that this year, the city of Whittlesea has once again very proudly partnered with Whittlesea Community Connections and DPV Health to host a number of activities, including a, a walk against violence and a youth art showcase, amongst a number of other things. We're also really looking forward to listening to the Youth Advisory Council Domestic Violence Group podcast, which will be released on the 10th of December. It's really sad to note that our municipality has high rates of family violence. And as we take part in these activities, we send our really heartfelt wishes to the friends and families of all victim survivors and we all look forward to a time when events such as these will no longer be necessary. Uh, and if you're interested to find out more information in relation to these 16 days of active activism and our various activities, please feel free to go on to Council's website. Uh, administrators, if you have a conflict of interest in relation to any item on the notice paper, you may verbally disclose the type and nature of the interest now, but you must make a declaration immediately before consideration of the matter in question. Are there any items for which you have a conflict of interest to declare? 
No Chair. No Chair. And I also have no conflict of interest to declare. Uh, I seek a motion to confirm the minutes of the following preceding meeting, which is the scheduled meeting of Council held on the 8th of November 2021. Do I have a mover? Uh, yes, Chair, happy to move. Thank you, Ms Duncan. And a seconder? Happy to second that, Chair. Thank you, Mr Eddy. Uh, I'll now put the matter to a vote. All those in favour of confirming the minutes? The motion is carried. Uh, moving on to public question time, I note, Mr Lloyd, that there is one public question that we've received for this council meeting. Uh, and I would ask that you both read the question and also provide the officer response in relation to the question. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. This question is from Thomas Fell, who lives in Mernda, and it relates, administrators, to the item 5.1.2 that you're considering this evening, the provision of leisure, aquatics and sports court facilities in Mernda. Uh, the question is, why is there no football ground in the new proposal for the Mernda Sports Hub precinct, as in the original proposal? We at Mernda Football Club have 22 sides and nowhere to do pre-season training. The junior cricket sides need to play away every week because there are not enough grounds. Uh, Council officer's response to that is, uh, is to say thank you, first of all, to Thomas for his question. Uh, tonight's item 5.1.2 regarding provision of facilities at the Murder Sports Hub site on Plenty Road seeks to confirm the scope of facilities for the aquatics, leisure and sports courts component of the precinct. The report identifies the number and scale of pools, gym and group fitness rooms, stadium and outdoor courts, so the Council can further progress planning and design and importantly, begin advocating for external funding. There are a number of other parts of the Mernda Sports Hub site for which Council will need to undertake further planning, including playing fields and other associated facilities. It is anticipated that the development of a master plan for the broader hub precinct will start in 2022, which will provide a vision and direction for the remaining outdoor sports facilities, such as ovals and change facilities, walking and shared paths, and integration with the Mernda Village Conservation Reserve. We'll be also developing a master plan for the Mernda Recreation Reserve on Shotters Road, Mernda, next year to guide the future development of that site. This site has been identified as an overflow ground and is currently used already for training. Council recently organised portable toilets to assist clubs using this ground for that purpose. There will be significant opportunities over the next 12 to 18 months for the community and user groups to have their say and provide feedback on the development of both the Mernda Sports Hub and Mernda Recreation Reserve Master Plans. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr Lloyd. Uh, I note that we also have two joint letters that have been submitted for the, the Council meeting this evening. Uh, firstly, we have a joint letter from four residents relating to a request for the removal of street trees on the corner of Strathoon Court and Vistaway, South Moran. Uh, Mr Lloyd, could you please read the details of that joint letter? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, so we wish to support the need to remove the trees in Strathoon Court on the corner of Vistaway and Strathoon. These trees are causing us huge problems and a visit from an arborist however well-intentioned, is simply no solution. The trees are dangerous and they must go. The trees from 43 Vista Way and over at 45 are causing enormous grief to residents. There are trees which also affect others and these are notes on this petition. Trees cast shadows on roof, making solar panels pointless. Trees constantly drop leaves on roof and gutters. It's costing us enormous fees for guttering and removal. Falling branches are dangerous. It's a matter of time when a serious accident will occur. Falling branches, uh, sorry, we, need, uh, we never ask for these trees and believe if they were creating a danger, they would be removed. The trees are lifting footpaths and potential damage to underground pipes. We urge you to finally remove these trees. We, the undersigned, are ratepayers and we want action taken. We are tired of being ignored. The officer recommendation is that um, council res resolve to receive the letters uh, from the residents and that the report be presented back to council at its meeting on the 31st of January. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, Mr Lloyd. Administrators, do you have any questions of Mr Lloyd in relation to this particular joint letter? No, no Chair. Uh, I'm then happy to table the joint letter and I move to resolve as follows that Council receive the joint letter from four residents regarding the removal of street trees on the corner of Strathoon Crescent and Vistaway South Morang, and that a report be presented to the Council meeting on the 31st of January uh, 2022 in relation to this matter. Do I have a seconder? Seconded. Thank you, Administrator Eddy. Uh, I don't wish to speak to the motion. Mr Eddy, do you wish to? No, thank you. Uh, in that case, I'll put the motion to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Uh, we have a second joint letter as well this evening, uh, and it's a joint letter from 11 residents requesting council add parking bays and pathways to the front of their properties on English Street, Donnybrook. Uh, and again, Mr Lloyd, if I could please ask you to read the joint letter and also the officer recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We, the undersigned residents and ratepayers of the City of Whittlesea, request the Council to have parking bays added to the front of our properties on English Street, Donnybrook, located in the Kinbrook Estate. We are also requesting that pathways are put in for easy access to each property. We are writing to the panel with concerns we have regarding the insufficient amount of parking in front of the properties on English Street, which are a cause of danger and great concern. Below is a list of reasons as to why we believe that parking should be added to the front of our properties. One, visiting cars are parking on English Street, making this a safety issue. The, car park on the, the cars park on the street do not leave enough space for cars to drive safely down English Street. Two, visiting cars are parking on the grass areas and due to the wet weather, this is ripping up the grass, leaving it muddy and not making the estate look appealing. Three, there are no walkways to enable access to our own properties. At night, this can be a particular concern as it could cause falls and trips. Four, one of our biggest concerns is that there is uh, an emergency, in the event of an emergency, there's no way of accessing any property without going through the muddy grass. Emergency services will be forced to carry the equipment through the muddy grass and then enter new homes with mud all over them. If a car is, number five, if a car is parked out the front of the properties on English Street, an emergency vehicle will have difficulty safely driving around that parked car to leave the Kinbrook estate. They will need to drive onto the island that separates the in and outbound lanes. The officer's recommendation then, Chair, is that Council uh, received this joint letter from the 11 residents uh, relating to the parking bays and off notes that officers will present a final report and recommendations to Council at its meeting on the 21st of March 2022. Uh, thank you again, Mr Lloyd. Uh, administrators, do you have any questions in relation to this joint letter? No, thank no. you. No, uh, I'm happy again to table the joint letter uh, and to move as outlined by Mr Lloyd, which is that council received the joint letter from 11 residents relating to the parking bays in English Street, Donnybrook, and request officers to present a final report and recommendation at the 21st of March, 2022 council meeting. Uh, do I have a seconder? Seconded. Thank you, uh, Mr. Eddy. Uh, I don't wish to speak to the motion, Mr. Eddy. No. no. I'll now put the motion to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you. Administrators will now be working through the agenda and obviously turning to general business items. And the first item, 5.1.1 is 17 to 19 Johnson's Road, Mernda, sale of council land. Uh, and if I could ask our Acting Director of Corporate Services, Mr Mark Montague, to provide a brief summary of this report and also the officer recommendations. Thank you, Mr Montague. Thank you, Chair. So following the conclusion of a community engagement process, the report seeks Council's approval to formally commence the process for the subdivision development and sale of corresponding lots in relation to Council-owned property at 17 to 19 Johnson's Road, Mernda. 
The report outlines the intention to sell 32 of the 35 lots of subdivision on the open market, with a further three lots to be reserved for the sale or lease to an appropriate social affordable housing provider in line with Council's social affordable housing policy. A further report to Council is expected to be provided in mid-2022, outlining the recommended method to facilitate affordable housing on these lots. The report gives rise to two options for the disposal of the subject land in the report, with option two, the subdivide and develop option, recommended as the preferred method. This is as it gives rise to a better return on investment for Council to use to fund future investment in key community infrastructure projects. Feedback through community consultation identified that the sale process for this land is supported, as is the proposed number of lots made available for social and affordable housing. The recommendations are as outlined in this report and happy to take any questions that Council may have. Uh, thank you, Mr Montague. And if my colleagues don't mind, if I could just quickly jump in on a short question by way of clarification. Uh, Mr Montague, I note that the attachment to the report uh, they're the August council meeting minutes and they have a watermark indicating unconfirmed. I just wonder if you could please clarify the status of those minutes. Sure, thank you, Chair. And I can confirm that the, those are the same minutes that were confirmed on this, at the 6th of September council meeting uh, by council. Uh, so the, it is an incorrect watermark on that, report, on that attachment. So I can confirm that those minutes are the same as that were, were adopted by council uh, and there is no uh, impact or change to either detail of the report or recommendations of the report as a result of that. Thank you, Mr Montague. Uh, Mr Eddy or Ms Duncan, do you have any additional questions of Mr Montague? Mr Eddy? Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr Montague, I understand, I appreciate your acting in the role at the moment. I just wonder whether you or perhaps the CEO, if appropriate, could say a bit more about how we've arrived at the number of lots to be reserved for affordable housing in this case, as we've um, mentioned previously, there's a significant demand for affordable housing in the city of Whittlesea, and obviously we're not going to be able to address all of that with one project, but how do we arrive at this particular number for this project? Uh, Mr Lloyd, I'll hand over to yourself, but you might equally want to hand over to one of the other officers in attendance. Mr Lloyd, sorry, you're on mute. Sorry about that, Chair. Um, I, I think Mr Montague will have an answer for that question. I'll, I'll leave it to him to answer first, and uh, if I need to follow up, I will. Thank you. Mr Montague? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. And look, I can confirm that, that that number has been looked at in consideration of other projects as well from, from that side of things with um, social and affordable housing implications from, from that side of things. Um, the number was come up with based on, on that assessment. Um, and from that, as I mentioned, in the, as outlined in the report, I think the community feedback um, was positive in relation to, to that number um, from that sense that it was thereabouts as, as the, what, what the community also felt to be about, about the right number from, from that sense. And if I may just follow up on that. So in terms of next steps for making those affordable housing lots available, uh, could you just confirm we will be receiving further reports and will be discussing the appropriate way to move forward with that next year sometime? Absolutely, Administrator. I can confirm that the, the intention is to bring a report uh, back to Council in about mid-2022 um, that will outline the, the approach as to making those, or the best method or approach to, to making those affordable housing lots available and, and how to facilitate that. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? No, thank you, Chair. Uh, do I then have a mover for the officer recommendation for item 5.1.1? Chair, I'm happy to move the recommendation as printed. Thank you, Mr Eddy. And a seconder? Uh, yes, Chair, happy to second that. Thank you, Ms Duncan. Uh, Mr Eddy, would you like to speak to this report? Uh, very briefly, Chair, this uh, proposal has undergone some com community engagement, as is outlined in the report, and uh, officers had a have arrived at the recommendation that's before us this evening. I, I have to say that as administrators, we've been privy to numerous discussions about 
this project and what is the appropriate role for the council to be playing in this project. And I think we've arrived at um, a sensible and responsible approach to uh, dealing with this land, but also trying to make, as small as it is with this project, uh, a contribution to uh, dealing with those um, very serious affordable housing issues that we have in the city of Whittlesea. And we're not alone on that, of course. It's, uh, it's a much broader problem, um, not just in Australia, but, but overseas, in fact. So um, good to see there was some community engagement. Disappointing to see there wasn't more, to be frank, but based on uh, the input that we've received and uh, the very considered um, advice that we've received. I'm happy to support this uh, recommendation and look forward to receiving further reports. Thank you, Mr. Eddy. Ms. Duncan? Uh, no, thank you, Chair. I think Administrator Eddy's summed that up perfectly. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if I could just make a couple of comments myself, um, because obviously this is a really important item. And I just wanted to really highlight that the property, which is the subject of this report, was purchased by the council from the state government in October 2014. And it was purchased with the strategic intent of selling it into the future and reinvesting the proceeds back into community infrastructure. And I think it's really uh, quite opportunistic that we're also considering another very, very important report, which is the next item on the agenda in relation to the Mernda uh, Leisure Precinct. Uh, so obviously the time has come to realise um, that desire to reinvest the proceeds back into community infrastructure. Uh, and so I'm really supportive of option two, which is for council to develop the site itself in accordance with the approved plan of subdivision. And that was the report that we referred to that council considered in August, 2021 and is appended to the report. And I just did wanna note that the previous report that we considered in August had some 12 and a half pages of conditions related to the subdivision of the land. And so I note that there were a few comments that were made through the submission process in relation to traffic and so forth. Uh, but those 12 and a half pages of conditions had many um, requirements in relation to minimising any negative impact on abutting properties, uh, ensuring appropriate residential development, including traffic management, access, alignment of roads, and reserves with the adjoining estate uh, and so forth. So I just really wanted to highlight that there is a direct link uh, between the report that we considered in August and obviously some of the comments that have come in in relation to the proposed sale of land. Uh, so on that note, I'm gonna put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you, Mr. Montague. Thank you. Uh, so we do move on now to item 5.1.2, provision of leisure, aquatics and sports court facilities in Mernda. Uh, and if I could ask our Director of Community Wellbeing, Ms. Kate McCacky, to uh, introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, so it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce this item regarding the provision of leisure, aquatics and sports courts facilities in Mernda. Uh, tonight's report has been, is a culmination of many years of um, work and effort um, by council officers, um, previous councils, this council and, um, the, and most importantly, the community. And I'll now hand over to Fiona Henningsen, uh, Acting Manager, Active and Creative Participation to present the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms McCacky. Thank you, Chair. Um, the proposed major leisure, aquatic and sports court facility to be located in the Mernda Sports Hub precinct will be one of Council's most significant investments in social and health infrastructure. It will meet the needs of both our community currently and our future community. It will be an incredible asset for the entire municipality. The community has been consulted on this project four times from 2013 to 2020. 
And following a council resolution in December 2020, officers have undertaken a feasibility and comparative analysis for project options for the aquatic and leisure facilities proposed for Mernda. This includes a consideration of a 25 metre lap swimming pool and a 50 metre lap swimming pool. Council engaged independent consultants to compare three lap swimming options, one of which I mentioned already, the eight lap 25 metre swimming pool, the eight lane 50 metre FINA lap swimming pool, and an eight lane 50 metre multi-purpose lap swimming, swimming pool. Uh, we also considered seven guiding principles, which are affordable, viable, accessible, equitable and safe, maximising social and health benefits. These were imperative in the decision-making process when considering the scope for the project and also led to the recommendation, the recommended option of a 50 metre multi-purpose pool. This option provides the advantages of improved accessibility outcomes and opportunities for additional and flexible programming achieved through a depth profile of the pool, temperature of the water, and additional space within the 50 metre multi-purpose pool. Uh, this option also combines the benefits of a 25 metre pool and a 50 metre FINA compliant pool. It facilitates whole of community use through its shallower depth profile and provides many of the benefits of a FINA pool. It's worth noting also that Victoria's infrastructure strategy 2021 to 2051 also identifies that aquatic and leisure centres play a key role in improving the quality of life within communities and recommended that a new aquatic centre is provided within the city of Whittlesea within the next five years. This project will enhance the quality of life for all of our residents as a place to exercise, get healthy and connect. It will improve health and wellbeing outcomes and create a welcoming sense of place and community. Um, it provides a cornerstone of the Mernda Sports Hub precinct. It will function at a local, municipal, and also regional level. So it is an asset for our entire municipality. The key components of the project include six indoor sports courts, including a show court, eight outdoor flood lit netball courts, the 50 meter multi-purpose pool with a boom wall, a warm water program pool, teaching pool, leisure pool, spa, steam and sauna, a gymnasium, group fitness, program rooms and occasional care, health consulting and wellness suites. It also embeds environmental design features such as all of the electric building, efficient heating, cooling and water systems, maximising thermal efficiency. Other features will include a cafe, family change village and changing places stations. The project design and construction cost is estimated as a, at a high level figure at around $113.4 million and construction is anticipated to start in 2025. Advocacy and partnerships will, will be actively pursued to attract external funding from pot potential project partners. As this is a key community asset for our entire community, there will be opportunities throughout the project for community involvement. There are 12 recommendations detailed in the report. I'll just provide a summary of those. The first four recommendations are to endorse the scope as outlined in the report and note that a detailed business case will be developed and presented to council in mid-2022 for your consideration. Uh, this will include further work around the estimated cost of the facility and um, the proposal for a single stage of construction. Recommendations five to seven, note the existing uh, significant project background and analysis that has occurred to date and the seven guiding principles I mentioned earlier. Recommendations eight to 10, note that the sports courts will be an advocacy priority for upcoming state and federal elections and that external funding will continue to be pursued for the entire facility. Recommendation 11 notes uh, the need to explore integrated options for leisure and community facility planning in our growth corridors. And the final two recommendations are to firstly note the valuable contribution from the community and project stakeholders thus far, 
And also to note that a community stakeholder reference group will be established in 2022 to continue to inform the facility planning through the early design stages. Uh, thank you, Ms. Henningsen, for such a comprehensive overview of this report. Uh, I am going to check with my colleagues whether they have any questions in relation to the report, and we might in the first instance direct them to our Director of Community Wellbeing. Um, yes, Joyce, um, I've got a question. For, Duncan. Uh, yep, Ms. McKackie. Um, we've just heard about the development of a stakeholder reference group. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering what the timing of the development will be on the communication and engagement plan and the actual terms of reference for the stakeholder engagement group. Um, obviously, um, Ms Henningsen has said that 2022 we will start this, but I'm just wondering if you could be a bit more specific around when those things will start first, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we'll, as... Um as Fiona mentioned, we'll, we'll kick that off in 2022. Uh, we'll do some communications initially with our 2,000 strong email uh, community email list uh, who have been, who've been kept in the loop regarding this, uh, this project to date through that mechanism. And we'll certainly do some uh, communications with that particular group straight away and also put some information out on our uh, various media channels. Um, in terms of the establishment of the community stakeholder reference group, that will be uh, really important that we look to recruit that um, and ensure we get a really broad and diverse uh, set of um, uh, community members on that, people with different types of lived experience, uh, from different cultural backgrounds, from different levels of um, abil physical abilities, um, So, real, and, and not just uh, Mernda and Doreen, but really across the municipality to make sure that it's got that whole of municipality uh, profile. So we'll look to do an, an expression of interest uh, for that very important stakeholder reference group, and we'll bring a terms of reference to, to council briefing early in the new year, um, that we'll just, we'll continue to press, that won't be, um, press ahead with that. Uh, that process, that won't be a separate re council report for the terms of reference. So, uh, Chair, I've just got a follow-up question. Yeah, so, of course. Um, we're basically, you're saying that the officers will start work on this in January and it will then uh, come... Maybe to February. A lot of people are taking leave in January because they actually can go somewhere this year. But, yes, definitely uh, uh, January, Feb, I'd say. Great. Thank you. Uh, I wonder whether I could just have a follow-up question, uh, Ms McKackie, because you partially covered it. So my query was really about how we're getting, going to get back to the many community members and project stakeholders who have got a real interest in this particular item. And I note that um, obviously there are petitioners as well, over 1,600 yeah. people who yeah. were signatories to the petition. How are we going to get back to all of those interested stakeholders. Yeah, so over the four um, community consultation pr uh, processes that we've held to date, where we have collected people's um, information for that purpose, for sharing information about the project, we'll certainly uh, do direct communications with them regarding tonight's decision. Um, and we'll also continue to promote the project through our broader range so that people who are now interested because they're um, following tonight's decision, if there's a formal way forward, um, we'll, I think we'll, we're anticipating we'll, we'll get a lot more interest because um, the purpose of tonight is pr to provide some clarity and scope of, about the project moving forward. So we won't just uh, contain it to the people who have been interested to date, but we'll look to sort of broaden uh, that reach and engagement. Thank you. And just one further question, if I could. Uh, I note that Ms Henningsen commented that there will be the start date, which will be in 2025. Uh, That's correct. Obviously, we're well aware that this is an extremely large, complex project and the desire to have a single start date, which I personally actively support. Uh, is there any possibility of having an earlier commencement date than 2025? I think until we've done the detailed business case and have done some further additional scoping around construction and design methods, um, I probably have to take that on notice and get back to you, but we certainly note your um, interest around the timing of the project. Could you please take that question on notice then, Mr. Yes, Kaki? we certainly can, yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Eddy, any uh, additional questions? Yes, yes, please, Chair, if I may, and thank you uh, for those questions uh, from yourself and from Administrator Duncan. I was wondering similar things. Um, Ms. McKacky, um, I do have a couple of questions. This is obviously a massive project by any standard for the city of Whittlesea and probably, probably the biggest decision that we as a panel of administrators are going to make. External funding is going to be so important for this, given the estimated price tag already of $113 million. I wonder if you could talk a bit about more, a bit more about what you mean by enhanced advocacy approaches um, with, uh, with relevance to pursuing external funding. Yeah, thank you. Um, so obviously, um, we, it will be critical to work with key partners around the advocacy on this project. So um, that's key partners in terms of the, um, the sports that we're going to be developing through this, whether it's netball, basketball, uh, etc. So that'll be a really important um, part of the enhanced advocacy approach, uh, because those um, Sporting associations have also identified a real need for these um, these codes within and a real gap in in within the municipality. So that will be critical. Um, but also, obviously, with two elections at both state and federal uh, levels coming up in the next twelve months, that that will also be an important part of our um, our approach. Thanks, Ms. McKacky. Um, the report also uh -huh. refers. Sorry, Chair. Sorry, Mr. Eddy. I just noticed that the, our CEO wanted to also make an additional comment. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I just wanted to add, uh, Councillor Ed, uh, Administrator Eddy, that the um, the state government recently uh, released the Infrastructure of Victoria report, and that has considerable weight on uh, these types of community facilities. So this is good timing for us in terms of approaching the state government around that recent. Uh, endorsement in principle that the state government has made to the recommendation in that report, um, obviously leading into a state election uh, later on uh, in November next year. So we'll be, what we mean by actively is, is not just putting out there our wishes, but actively meeting with members of parliament, other key influences to make sure that they understand the needs of our community and making sure that they understand that this is not just an aquatic facility, but this is a well-being facility and the broader range of services that this facility will provide our community, which are much lacking uh, in, our, in our municipality and in that immediate area as well. Thanks, Mr. CEO. That was, in fact, my follow-up question. And, and, and thank you, by the way, for, for bestowing upon me the briefest ever <laughs> status as councillor. Um, <laughs> just on the inf Infrastructure Victoria report, I noticed the government has responded to that. It's, it's made on my reading a fairly um, uh, broad response in terms of support in principle. Does that give us some, uh, some hope that there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a crack into which we could start to permeate? I believe so. That, the, that particular um, recommendation in the report was, was an in principle support. But in reading the text of the government's response to that, it was quite clear that they weren't necessarily um, supporting in principle the proposal, what they were saying was that there need, needed to be more work done on where, how that would be funded, what grants programs and the like might be linked to that. But the, the actual need was acknowledged. So I do take some, some strong hope from that. Terrific. And I do have one more, if I may, Chair. Uh, I sort of hesitate to bring this up. It's, uh, it, it's a bit of pedantry around words. I'm just concerned that in the recommendation, we're endorsing a project scope which will likely include, and I think it, we've had many briefings on this, and we've uh, very strongly formed the view that this municipality deserves and can support a 50 metre pool, for example. So I guess I'm looking for some commentary on um, how, how set in concrete can this wish list be, given we've got a lot of work to do around design and business case. It just worries me that it says we'll likely include rather than something more definitive around a clear preference for. Ms. Ms. McCacky, do you want to respond to that? I'm happy to respond to that. Um, so just in our business planning uh, and project feasibility uh, continuum, typically what we do is identify at this stage um, the likely, the preferred um, scope, which is what this is, uh, with a view to those that, that final scope being confirmed through the business case. So this is the scope that we are working towards um, 
that we'll be prosecuting in terms of its feasibility, what that means in terms of long-term income and cost, um, and that we'll bring back the final scope to you. The idea is not to, to change it if possible, but there's lots of known unknowns at this point in time, and, and um, until we can give you that um, more robust um, advice, um, we're, hence we've used the, the language in that, in that way. Yes, I'm sure that's sensible. Thank you for that explanation. But the point is, we'll receive a further report before that business case is finalised. Um, Absolutely. Sometime next year. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr Eddy. And I think it's a good point that you did clarify. And thanks, Ms McKackie. So on the basis of um, our questions and discussions, uh, I'm very happy to move the officer recommendation for item 5.1.2. Uh, do I have a seconder? I'm happy to second this one, Chair. Thank you, Ms Duncan. Uh, I'm really pleased to be moving this particular item and the officer recommendations, and I strongly support the proposed scope uh, for this leisure aquatic and sports facility, which will be located in Mernda. But I really did want to highlight a number of key points from my perspective, and some of them have already been covered off by officers or through the questions that we've asked. Um, firstly, it's already been noted that this is the most significant infrastructure project that we as administrators have ever resolved upon and unlikely to again resolve on uh, anything of this scope and magnitude. Uh, and it is a legacy project of paramount importance to the whole of the Whittlesea community, not just Mernda. And I think it's really important that Ms Henningsen had actually noted the significance of this uh, facility in relation to local, municipal and actually regional, which um, is just how important it is. Uh, clearly, this issue has got a really long history, which goes back to 2011, with successive councils considering different options and very significant community and stakeholder comment, including, as I made mention of earlier, a petition from over 1,600 with over 1,600 signatures calling on council to develop the 50 metre pool, not the 25 metre pool. So there's a very, very long history uh, associated with this issue. So as um, our officers have indicated, and it's really clear from the council report, this proposal is to develop a 50 metre multi-purpose pool with the boom wall, together with other important wet areas, the gymnasium, health consulting suites and six indoor sports courts, including a show court and eight outdoor floodlit netball courts, which will be of benefit to children, families and older people of all backgrounds and all ages across the whole of the city of Whittlesea and, as we've noted, regionally as well. And this is really going to be a significant wellbeing and leisure recreation project for all of our residents. Uh, clearly, this facility addresses some large gaps that we have within the municipality in relation to leisure facilities, as we currently don't have a 50 metre pool within the municipality, and we have a great shortage of uh, indoor and outdoor netball facilities. It's already been touched on by my colleagues and also by our CEO that Infrastructure Victoria uh, specifically acknowledges the key role played by aquatic and leisure facilities, uh, particularly in growth councils, but in improving the quality of life of residents. And it specifically recommended that a new aquatic facility is required within the city of Whittlesea within the next five years. And I think it's, um, as our CEO indicated, the government has um, responded with in principle support. But that was a really important recommendation within the Infrastructure Victoria report. I think it's really important for residents of Whitsey that they also understand that administrators have done our own due diligence in relation to this matter because it's such an important issue and obviously it's significant uh, funding as well. 
Uh, so we not only considered all of the previous council reports and community consultation findings, but we've also had multiple council briefings in relation to this matter. We had a meeting with the independent consultant. In fact, we've had a few who undertook the analysis of the different options. Uh, and we also met with management of other 50 metre pools because we felt it was so critical that we really understood the issues for Whittlesea and also the funding implications as well. And, and we really understood the options that, that were likely to be presented. Uh, and probably the final comment I, I really wanted to make is it's been touched on uh, particularly by Administrator Eddie in relation to we want to minimise the rate burden from this project as clearly there will be a funding gap in relation to developer contributions and it's our commitment uh, as administrators in conjunction with council officers that we aggressively pursue a number of alternative revenue streams, whether it's federal or state government grants or other partnerships. Uh, and really, we need to embark on a strong advocacy campaign to government. So I really look forward to the development and further consideration of the detailed business case, which is based on this current project scope. Uh, but I also really want to acknowledge the amazing and tireless work of council officers uh, because they have really responded. They've taken into account the diverse community views in relation to this issue. Uh, and this has been an inordinate amount of work to get to the point that we are today. So, uh, Ms. McCacky, or to Mr. Lloyd and Ms. McCacky and your teams. Uh, please pass on our appreciation for the um, excellent work of council officers to get to this point. Uh, I'll now uh, hand over to my colleague, Ms Duncan, who's the seconder of this particular item. Um, thank you, Chair. I think you've really covered off everything that um, I would have liked to say, but you've said it beautifully, I think. and. I'm just delighted that after, I think it's 2012 or 2013, that we have done, as you said, a lot of due diligence around this project. And I'm just delighted that we are now in a position to actually deliver it for the community. Um, and as you spoke about, I think it's an important asset for the community to have, and not just for our municipality, but I think it's a build it and they will come as well um, in those neighbouring um, suburbs or municipalities, I should say. Um, and I just think it's, uh, it's a very good legacy we can leave for the growing community that we have um, and also as an attraction um, piece for people to come and live in Whittlesea and enjoy how good our community is. So I'm happy to support this as well. And, as, and to your words as well, just thank you to all of the um, office, officers at the council for all the work that you've put into this and and just to reiterate the many, many briefings we've had, we haven't taken this decision lightly. We're very well informed, um, basically doing a very clear due, due diligence on this project. So I look forward to seeing the business case. Thank you, Ms Duncan. Mr Eddy, would you like to speak to this item? I would, thank you, Chair. Uh, I support all of your comments and those of Administrator Duncan, so I might just underscore a couple of those, given it is, as we've said a couple of times, probably the most significant decision that we'll make during our term. I was surprised, to be frank, to see the, the history to this issue. It's been bubbling away in this community for quite some time. So. Um, I think it's, uh, it's incumbent upon us to, to rip this Band-Aid off, get this decision made and get cracking on delivering a facility that clearly is, is needed in the city of Whittlesea. I think when you look at the project scope, this is going to tick a lot of boxes. Uh, it's not just about a pool. It's not just about netball. It's not just about indoor sports. It's about so much more. But we've already seen from a public question tonight that there are pockets of the community that will be looking for more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's really hard to tick all the boxes that you need to and meet all the needs in the community. But this goes a long way towards it. But it, it is a significant investment. 
The other point I want to underscore is that while the report might say uh, provision of leisure, aquatics and sport court facilities in Moonda, as, as has mm -hmm. been made, this will be a municipal facility. And I think we need to think now about how do we get that message out. This is for the broader community. And I get that, you know, people will only travel certain distances. But I think if you build the right facility of the right quality that offers the right services, um, as they say in the classics, if you build it, they will come. And I think that's uh, another point, important point to be underscored here, the municipal nature of the facility. I want to underscore the commitment that uh, Administrator Wilson mentioned to pursuing aggressively those external funding opportunities, because let's face it, we're going to need them. This is a big ticket item. And I want to also underscore the importance of that community and stakeholder reference group that will be set up mm -hmm. at an early stage to help guide the development of uh, the scope for this project to make sure that it's right for this community. So I think summing all of that up, it's it's really exciting. It's probably one of the more exciting decisions we'll make and I'm really, really pleased to support it. Thank you, Mr. Eddy. Um, I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Uh, thank you again, Ms. Henningsen and Ms. McCackey. Uh, item 5.1.3, Leisure Centres COVID-19 contract variation and, in, uh, and proposed extension. Uh, and again, if I could invite Ms McCackie, our Director of Community Wellbeing, to introduce this item and um, the Officer recommendations. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the Leisure Contracts COVID-19 Contract Variation and Proposed Extension Report has really um, come out of the sort of extraordinary events of the last uh, six to 12 months where we've had um, our second wave uh, of lockdowns. Um, and I'll now um, hand over to um, Fiona Henningsen, Active, Acting Manager, Creative and Active Participation, to present the report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Henningsen. Thank you, Chair. Belgravia at Leisure have contracts with Council for the Management and Operation of Mill Park Leisure and Whittlesea Swim Centre, which commenced on the 1st of November 2020, and also a second contract for Thomastown Aquatic and Recreation Centre since the 1st of July this year. The contracts have performed to a high level to date while the centres have been operational. Prior to lockdown five and six, Belgravia at Leisure was performing well above contract targets at Mill Park Leisure. However, due to the COVID-19 restrictions, Mill Park Leisure and Track have been closed for 79% of the first four months of the financial year. Given the difficult operating environment, a financial variation to these contracts is proposed to, to address the impacts of these closures. It is also proposed that the contracts be extended for two years to suit operational requirements and provide extra data to Council. A contract extension is provided for within the current contract provisions. These contracts include contract number 2021-141 for the management and operation of Thomastown Recreation and Aquatic Centre, and also contract number 2020-059 for the management and operation of Mill Park Leisure and Whittlesea Swim Centre. Officers will work with Belgravia Leisure to prepare a guaranteed and non-guaranteed budget for both contracts for the period of the 1st of July 2022 to the 30th of June 2024, and we'll report back to Council for endorsement on this early in the new year. An additional point is that in response to the impacts of COVID-19 on our community, Council um, could consider fully subsidising the entry fees at Whittlesea Swim Centre for the remainder of the 2021-22 season. A number of councils across Victoria, including, including our neighbouring shires of Mitchell and Murrindindi, have made their entry fees at their outdoor pools um, free in recent years. Free usage of Whittlesea Swim Centre would encourage broader community use and assist local children in the practice of life-saving swimming skills. The recommendation for this report is that Council approve the contract variation for Thomastown Aquatic and Recreation Centre for $326,431 and also for Mill Park Leisure and Whittlesea Swim Centre for $41,446. 
and these are due to interruptions to business operations caused by the COVID-19 closures and restrictions. Our second recommendation is to approve the extension of the contracts for an additional two years to the 30th of June 2024. And as mentioned earlier, this will be subject to receiving a revised budget where we will report back to Council in early 2022. The final recommendation is for the extension of the Mill Park Whittlesea contract to include a trial for the Whittlesea Swim Centre uh, current season to include free entry um, and also to include an evaluation of this at the end of the season. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henningsen. Um, administrators, any questions in relation to this item? No, Chair. Mr. Eddy? Chair, just to clarify that the, the recommendation that's being put to us around variations and extensions are all allowed for in the current contracts, correct? Through the chair, um, yes, that absolutely, that's correct. And um, the reason why the contract, this report has come to you tonight is we need to provide advice to the contractor by the 1st of January if we are intending to extend them, hence um, coming to council for a decision tonight on the matter. So, but that's certainly been very carefully looked at in the preparation of this report. Can I also ask for a little more information around the thinking of the, uh, the free entry trial for Windlesea Swim Centre? Is, is that something that was envisaged in the contract or are we adding that into this extension? No, that's an addition, in addition to the current contract. Um, it's not out of scope in terms of the provisions about um, creating accessible services, um, addressing um, needs in the community such as learn to swim, which we know with increasing drought, drownings in the community is a really critical issue with the disruption to a lot of swimming lessons over the last couple of years. Um, so it's not out of scope, but it is a new item which we'll um, look at in terms of a uh, discussion when we go back to the contractor and which uh, will be brought back to council um, and once that negotiation has occurred. So this, will, this the final terms of the um, contract with the updated budget will be brought back to Council for endorsement, if that makes sense. Yes, and the, and the free entry trial is just for this season with further consideration. Uh, well, no, actually what was proposed is, just to be clear about that, I was, I was going to... Uh, it's actually proposing that it's for the next two... Um, for the remaining two years, but we'll do an evaluation at the end of each season to look at the efficacy, the impact, etc. Okay, understood. Thank you. Any further questions, administrators? No? Um, do I then have... Sorry, Miss Duncan, did you have a question yes, or...? Yes. I've just got a question about the, um, the trial for the free entry. When will that commence? Uh, that will commence with the current season. So that'll kick in once the contract has been um, but, um, has been resolved. However, the, the season will mostly be over, but for, prior to council resolving on it. Does that make sense? So it might just get the shoulder end at the end of the current season, but it'll certainly kick in for next season. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sorry, Chair, if I can just, can I follow up on that? Mr. Eddie, of course. Sorry, I'm sure it's in the report somewhere, but I just can't find it. Have we put a a value on the the foregone cost of providing that free entry trial? Yeah, so it's in the report and we it, it's about, I think over the last uh, three or four years, we've taken about 50,000 um, per annum on that, on the, on the takings. But there is also uh, qualitative advice from the industry that where you reduce... Um, Entry fees, you increase your income in the kiosk and other sort of sales. So it, that's, well, that'll be part of the evaluation. So we'll have a look at that moving forward. It can also obviously depends on how hot the summer is because it's an outdoor pool. So there'll be a number of factors that impact on um, income for outdoor seasonal pools. So they're quite variable, in fact. But if I recall correctly, we're subsidising that facility for far more than that amount. Much that you've more. Absolutely. Anyway. Yep. Yes, yep, yes, definitely. I, I've just found the, the relevant paragraph. Thank you, yep. Ms McCaffrey. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr Eddy. Do I have a mover for the officer recommendation for item 5.1.3? I'm happy to move that, Chair. Thank you, Mr Eddy. And a seconder? Um, I'm happy to do that, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms Duncan. 
Mr Eddy, would you like to speak to this item? Uh, Chair, I don't think there's much more to add from the discussion we've just had. This seems like a reasonable approach to dealing with the impacts of, of COVID. It doesn't seem reasonable that you, uh, you hold those contract terms uh, to the letter given what's occurred. So uh, the variation and the extensions, I think, uh, are reasonable. Uh, I think the free trial is worth trying. Let's, uh, let's see how it goes. Um, and I look forward to receiving some further reports on, uh, on progress in due course. Thank you, Mr Eddy. Ms Duncan? Uh, no, what Administrator Eddy said, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'll then put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you, Ms Henningsen uh, and Ms McCacky. Uh, item 5.1.4, Complaints Policy. And again, if I could ask our Acting Director of Corporate Services, Mr Montague, to introduce this item and the Officer Recommendations. Thank you, Chair. So the report provides Council's updated complaints policy for adoption following a community engagement process. Uh, Council's complaints policy seeks to put in place an open and transparent customer complaint handling system to ensure that complaints from our customers are handled fairly and objectively. Further, the policy represents a commitment to being accessible and responsive to our customers, promoting a culture that encourages feedback and continuous improvement for all our Council service areas. On this note, the policy also, also provides appropriate levels of escalation if a customer's complaint is not satisfactorily resolved in the initial instance, with the option to also request an internal review of an outcome. The recommendation is as outlined in the report and will also ensure that Council meets its requirements under the Local Government Act 2020, requiring that Council adopts a complaints policy by 31 December 2021. Uh, thank you and happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Montague. Administrators, do you have any questions relating to this item? Yes, Chair. Chair. I do. Miss Duncan um, and then Ms. Grady. <laughs> um, Mr. Montague, just in regards to there will be an internal review process, could you please confirm that also in the complaints policy that if a resident in it isn't satisfied with the internal decision that they will have an external third party to go to? That is correct, Administrator. So the, the policy, as mentioned, does allow for um, an escalation process to, to senior officers internally and an internal review process. If a satisfactory outcome isn't achieved, uh, the policy does also provide for options to be explored outside of council to have that complaint considered. Right, thank you. Mr Eddy. Uh, I didn't chair, but I have now. Um, I just wanted to <laughs> check with Mr Montague um, because I thought it was in the report, but again, I can't find it. It might be me tonight. Oh, it's all right. I just found it. I just wanted to confirm that the Victorian Ombudsman's report and recommendations have been one of the key inputs to developing this new complaints policy. I Mr. certainly Montague? can I certainly can confirm that, Administrator. So that there were minimal changes out of out of that. As uh, so a council has previously had a complaints policy in place, uh, it's only now a requirement of the local government act that that be formally adopted by council. But yes, can confirm that the um, the policy is developed in accordance with those recommendations. Do you know what sorts of things are different as a result of that ombudsman's review? I'm sorry if I'm putting you on the spot. I'm happy for you to take it on notice. I may take it on notice just so I can provide a more fulsome answer, but um, all I can comment now on at the moment is that there were minimal changes. So I believe that council's existing policy was was in line with um, with those outcomes, but I'll get back to you if there was anything specific worth noting. I think uh, Mr Lloyd would like to respond to that question, so he might shed some light. Thank you, Chair. Look, I, I can cover that off. So. The main change was around the definition of a complaint and, and the Ombudsman provided uh, clarity of what was a complaint as opposed to what was a request of council. And we've tidied up that wording uh, in, in our policy uh, to make that very clear what the difference is. But if I may chair, um, fair to say that there was very little really that needed to be changed to comply with what the Ombudsman sees as best practice? Yes, certainly in our case, our policy needed minimal changes. The way that we were counting complaints and managing them was very much in line with 
the new direction of the ombudsman, but the, the ombudsman sought to bring that uh, conformity and, and standardisation across the state. That's good to know. If there's no more questions, Chair, I'm happy to move this item. Uh, I think we're we're done. So thank you, Mr. Eddy. You're going to move the officer recommendation for item 5.1.4, and I'm happy to also second the officer recommendation. Uh, so, um, Mr. Eddy, would you like to speak to the item? Only very briefly, Chair, as we've heard, our policy, it wasn't broken. Um, we've had some minor adjustments. Uh, it's good to know that we were already well uh, compliant with best practice as uh, in the opinion of the, uh, the Victorian Ombudsman and her recent work. Um, someone I used to work with quite some time ago in local government used to talk about complaints as being a gift, which I thought was perhaps overstating a little bit, but I think the principle is right. Um, complaints are a way to see how you're functioning, how effectively you're, you're doing what you need to be doing for the community, where you're falling down, where you can improve. Uh, it adds value to the entire process and we need to take them seriously and have a very clear process for doing so. This policy absolutely sets that out. I know it's a bit dry and a lot of people aren't going to bother reading it until they have a complaint, but that's the purpose of it. It's there to guide them if they do find themselves in that situation. Happy to recommend it. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Eddy. And I think um, your summary was excellent. Um, the notion that complaints are a gift, uh, I think is exactly the sentiment in a way that I wanted to express. Our consultation and engagement policy that we adopted uh, clearly indicates our commitment that we want to hear from our residents often and on a full range of different issues. Uh, and uh, that includes complaints. And obviously that gives us a capacity to get feedback from residents and the continuous improvement. So I'm happy to second the, um, the item. Uh, Ms. Duncan, did you want to make any further comments? I'll then put the item to a vote. All those in favour, the motion is carried. Uh, thank you, Mr Montague. Item 5.1.5, proposal to lease 1F Ashline Street Willert for affordable housing. And if I could invite um, our Director of Planning and Development, Mr O'Mara, to introduce this item or introduce council officers. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to introduce the author of this report, Joanna Stubbins, Social Policy and Planning Officer, who will provide a brief overview of the report and recommendations. Over to you, Joe. Thank you, Mr. O'Mara, and thank you, Chair. This officer report relates to the proposal to consider leasing the vacant council-owned property at 1F Ashland Street, Woolert, to a community housing organisation to deliver affordable housing for local people. The recommendation to undertake community consultation on this proposal was adopted by Council in September this year. And this was in response to the significant shortfall of affordable housing in, um, across the municipality. There are currently around 3,800 households with an unmet, unmet need for affordable housing in the city of Whittlesea. And this gap will grow, continue to grow with their growing population. At the moment, there are very few rental properties available for households with very low incomes. Um, and in the 12 months to June this year, there were no rental properties available for households with very low incomes uh, in the Woolert area. A community consultation was held between September and October this year to gather community feedback on the proposal in line with our community engagement policy. The consultation involved survey, a survey, uh, letters to surrounding residents and property owners, um, and an online information session. We'd like to extend our gratitude to all the community members who participated in this consultation, including residents, property owners, local housing service providers, um, and those with a connection to the area. All the feedback received as part of this consultation has been collated and will be reflected in the report that goes to council um, for consideration before a decision is made on this proposal. 
Um, however, we received a large volume of questions and feedback as part of the consultation. And unfortunately, due to the pandemic lockdown requirements, we weren't able to hold additional engagement activities in response to these questions, um, particularly because face-to-face -face consultation wasn't allowed. We also received feedback um, directly from the community um, seeking that the consultation uh, be extended to allow further information um, about the proposal and uh, additional opportunities to provide input. We want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to raise and discuss any issues before a decision is made. So this report recommends that we continue the community engagement next year so the community can participate in discussions about this proposal and provide feedback. The report also recommends inviting community members who responded to the first phase of consultation to take part in the engagement activities next year. Um, we then present the outcomes of the community engagement uh, process at a subsequent council meeting to inform the consideration of leasing this property for affordable housing for local people. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms Stubbings. Administrators, do you have any questions of Ms Stubbings? No, Chair. Ms. No? Uh, all right. Well, thanks again for that comprehensive overview. I'm happy to move the officer recommendation for item 5.1.5. .5. Uh, do I have a seconder? I'm happy to do this one, Chair. Thank you, Ms Duncan. I, I think, as I indicated um, in moving the item, that Ms Stubbings has really provided a really comprehensive overview of what we're considering this evening, which is, in essence, uh, allowing further time for community comment in relation to Council's proposal to lease the land at 1F Ashline Street in Willert for an, for an affordable housing development. And I think the key issue for me is really just noting that even though we've had that really extensive uh, engagement, uh, unfortunately, the bulk of it has been online. Uh, including the virtual information session because of obviously the COVID-19 restrictions. So it has limited the opportunity for council to have that direct engagement with community members and to have those conversations and public forums uh, in person. So I think uh, it's critical that we don't lose sight of the comment that Ms Stubbings made that we've got a huge local need for affordable housing within the municipality. And Ms Stubbings cited that figure of 3,800 households currently in need and increasing. And I think that is a really important point to note. So for myself, I'm really keen to ensure that there's every opportunity for council to be able to clearly outline the proposal, to hear from all parties. And I'm talking about housing providers, other experts in the field, and also to be able to respond to any queries that our community members might have. Uh, and I'm actually looking forward to being there in person uh, to listen to the diverse views uh, of all of those different stakeholders uh, prior to being um, able to consider the matter further at a forthcoming council meeting. Uh, would the seconder like to speak to this item? Um, thank you, Chair. I concur with everything you've said. I think it will be very good for us to get back into person when we do have another consultation with the community. Um, I think um, we, we know that from our research that there are 10,000 households in the municipality that are paying 30% um, of their income on rent or mortgage payments. And I think um, just to be mindful that the demographic of those that need um, affordable housing or who are, are vulnerable and need to have um, the housing available, I think it's changed quite a bit since COVID. Um, this The sort of stereotype that some people may have, I think that's shifted a lot. Um, over the past nearly two years through the COVID pandemic. And I think it's going to be a great opportunity for all of us as administrators and the officers um, to actually have a town hall style meeting to talk through the issues here today about the affordable housing need in our municipality. Thank you, Ms Duncan. 
Uh, any further comments, Mr. Eddy? If I may, Chair, just to support those comments, it's important we get this right. So taking some extra time to make sure that we do get it right, I think is the appropriate thing to do. Otherwise, I concur with Administrator Duncan's concurrence with your comments, Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Eddy. I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you, Ms. Stubbings. Uh, item 5.1.6, Maternal and Child Health Sector Advocacy. Uh, and if I could introduce again, Ms. McCackie, who I think in turn will be introducing another council officer to present on this report. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce Amelia Ryan, Manager of Children and Families to present on this report. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. McCackie. Thank you. And thank you, Chair. I am pleased to present this report before Council tonight. The Maternal and Child Health Service provides support, care and education to families at one of the most crucial and memorable times in their lives. In the city of Whittlesea, this service alone supports over 21,000 children per year from birth to six years old. The service provides 10 key age and stage visits from when a baby comes home from the hospital up until three and a half years old. The service provides breastfeeding and lactation support, sleep and settling support, critical identification and referral to appropriate services, and overall provides a comprehensive and cohesive foundation of support to families. The service continued to operate throughout the pandemic, continually adapting to restrictions and changes to service delivery, and never missing a beat in being present for families. The challenges being experienced in the sector currently are significant and require immediate attention to continue to respond to the ever evolving needs of community, particularly in a time where this service provides critical care and the rebuilding of community post pandemic. The crucial work of this service is complicated by sector workforce shortages and burnout, the expansion of the scope of the care age and stage framework without additional time allocation, gaps in the current funding model, particularly in relation to infrastructure and the enhanced program, which supports our most vulnerable or in need families, and a software platform that doesn't meet the program's needs. In recognition of these compounding challenges, the Interface Councils Group have commissioned the development of an issues paper that outlines these pressures and a suite of advocacy asks that represent a series of interventions to respond to these issues. The collective advocacy of the Interface Councils Group represents the coming together of the councils experiencing unique and growing pressures in the MCH, Maternal Child Health, space. There are four recommendations before Council tonight. Firstly, to endorse the issues paper and the advocacy asks as Council's advocacy position. The report also asks Council to note the advocacy position of the Municipal Association of Victoria and the intended review of the key age and stage framework by the Department of Health and the Municipal Association of Victoria. This report represents a key action in progressing our own advocacy activity support, to support this sector in its time of need. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms Ryan. Uh, administrators, do you have any questions of Ms Ryan or Ms McCackie? Um, yes, Chair, for Ms Ryan. Um, can you further outline how you propose we will roll out um, our advocacy on this important issue and what the timelines might be? I'm happy to speak to that if that's okay, Chair. Thank you, Ms. McCarthy, um, of course. So this, um, this is a really a, a two-stage advocacy project. The first, um, uh, the first stage is to sort of get consensus across the Interface Councils Group around what the advocacy issues are. Um, and we're working with um, the Agenda Group, which is the consultancy that's been engaged by, by the, the Interface Councils um, to then prepare a strategy around the best approach uh, in terms of what those, that advocacy would look like. It's a really, really good question, Administrator Duncan. Um, but really, I think one of the things that we've been talking about as a group is about what all good advocacy does, which is not just a transactional relationship, but actually identifies what the shared problems are across different levels of government and then the best way to work out how collectively we can address the issue at hand. And that's certainly um, that collaborative approach that we want to take with government is around identifying the issue and then working collaboratively towards um, some better outcomes. But we'll certainly keep um, council in the loop around what those specific um, actions and initiatives are, but they're yet to be discussed by the Interface Council. And so just a follow-up 
question. Um, so what's the timelines you're working to with the interface group? Yep, so councils at the moment are, are presenting their, the, these reports to council for endorsement in terms of the efficacy agenda, what, what, are, the, what are the priorities? Um, and then the, the idea is that in the next couple of months, no later than February, we'll be back in the chamber with the specific actions. But if they're any earlier, we'll certainly, um, we'll certainly come back earlier than that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCarkey. Um, I, I wonder, just to further to Ms. Duncan's question, whether I could ask uh, if you could shed any further light in relation to the Municipal Association of Victoria's ad advocacy priorities in terms of um, there's a table within the council report, table three, which is yep. a very brief summary of the priorities of the um, Municipal Association of Victoria. Can you clarify what their proposed advocacy approach uh, and again timelines is? I might uh, refer that to Amelia. Ms Ryan. Thank you. Uh, so the Municipal Association of Victoria um, have set their focus areas for 2022, which are the four dot points that are in table yep. three. Um, in relation to the question around what those activities will look like and the conversations that will follow, we are not yet abreast of the, um, the strategy that they're adopting, um, but they have confirmed to us that this is the focus um, from their lens um, in their continued advocacy to the Department of Health in particular. Um, some of the, um, of the initiatives do really relate to the, um, the pressures that we are feeling and we absolutely support that from an officer level that, that those are really relevant um, activities. But in terms of the details, we're yet to be updated on, on the detail. Thank you, um, Ms Ryan. Any further questions, administrators? No? Uh, so do I have a mover for the officer recommendation for item 5.1.6? Um, Chair, I'm happy to move uh, the officer recommendation for this report, but with the following additional parts five and six. So part five, I'm not sure if we've put that on the screen, thanks, is to write to all local state government members of parliament regarding this important statewide issue to seek their advocacy support and provide them with this report and attach documentation. And part six, actively explore partnership opportunities with relevant educational institutions to address the workforce gaps in relation to maternal and child health nursing. Thank you, Ms Duncan, and I'm very happy to second the officer recommendations with those two additional parts, so thank you for that. Uh, Ms Duncan, would you like to speak to the report? Uh, no, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I might just make a couple of comments, and I think we could take that um, the recommendations down now, thank you. But, um, I must admit, I thought I was really quite well informed in relation to maternal and child health services. And I must admit that in reading the really comprehensive officer report and the interface paper and um, so forth, that I was really quite surprised and quite shocked to understand some of the current issues that are being experienced right across uh, the whole range of maternal and child health services, which is such an important service to all of our communities, uh, not just in Victoria, but nationwide. Uh, and particularly, uh, I was quite surprised to fully understand that there are significant shortages in relation to the recruitment and retention of maternal and child health nurses, uh, the additional demands that are being placed on our nurses, I was totally shocked with the issue of the lack of funding for infrastructure and IT, uh, and also the obsolete information system database, which doesn't really even have an ability for people to make online booking of appointments. So I was really very, very surprised and fully supportive of a strong uh, advocacy approach 
supporting the interface group of councils, uh, but also more broadly. And I think um, Ms Duncan's additions, particularly in relation to writing to all of our local state government members of parliament is a really uh, key point in that as well with the relevant documentation. Uh, Mr Eddy, did you want to speak at all to the report? I think you've covered it very well. I share your surprise at the scope of these issues, some of which have been around for quite a long time, to be honest, particularly the IT system issue, mm. for example. I'm aware of discussion about that going back quite some years. Um, and I think the point's well made uh, in the report that at this particular time, as we have hopefully a post-pandemic recovery phase, these are the sorts of services that need to be running yeah. in tip-top form. Um, so this is the sort of stuff we should be advocating on. Um, uh, kudos to the interface group for doing this. Hopefully the MAV will also uh, take this up strongly in the coming year. And I'd like to think that other council groupings will also uh, fall behind this in other parts of the state because it's not a unique problem just to our part yeah. of the world. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Eddy. I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Uh, thank you, Ms Ryan. Uh, item 5.2.1, Tender Evaluation 2021-12, Supply of Roadside Hazard Protection Works. Uh, and if I could introduce our Director of Infrastructure and Environment, Ms Debbie Wood. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report recommends that Council awards a contract for the supply of roadside hazard protection works to Barrier Designs um, based on a schedule of works arrangement up to 2.5 in value, 2.5 million in value. Um, barrier Design was selected from the, a field of tenderers based on a range of tender evaluation criteria, which included a 60% weighting on price. Roadside hazard protection works include guardrails, signs and other works that protect road users from potential hazards in the road environment. This bulk contract will also provide uh, improved data collection for Council's asset management system to guide future asset renewal uh, and maintenance programs. The contract is scheduled to commence on the 1st of January 2022 for an initial three-year period uh, with an option of an extension with a total contract period of up to five years. So um, just uh, recommend the recommendations as per the report. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms Wood. Uh, administrators, any questions of Ms Wood on this report? No, Chair. No. So do I have a mover then for the officer recommendation for item 5.2.1? I moved. Mr Eddy and a seconder? Yes, Chair. Ms Duncan. Uh, Mr Eddy, would you like to speak to the report? Just very, very briefly, Chair. We've had some big ticket items on our agenda tonight. It would be easy to just brush over this one and dismiss it, uh, but we shouldn't because this is pretty significant, uh, not only in terms of the size of the tender, but this is about saving lives. Um, roadside hazards uh, and, uh, you know, protecting people from those high risk areas. So um, very important work that needs to be done. Happy to support the recommendation. Thank you, Mr Eddy. Would the seconder like to speak? No, thank you, Chair. Mr Eddy summed it up beautifully. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Duncan. I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Wood. Uh, item 5.2.2, 11 Ruth Street, Layla. And again, if I could invite our Director of Planning and Development, Mr O'Mara, to introduce this item. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to introduce the author of this report, um, Planner Lachlan Ewell, who's just coming on the screen now, to, um, who's going to provide a brief overview of the report and recommendations. Over to you, Lachlan. Thank you, Justin, and thank you, Chair. This application proposes the construction of three dwellings at 11 Ruth Street in Laylor. The dwellings are proposed at a double storey height scale and all consist of two bedrooms. Public notification for this application was undertaken and nine objections were received, of which grounds of, rejection, of objection were consistently in relation to an increase of traffic and loss of on-street car parking, 
particularly during school times, uh, a poor response to existing neighbourhood character, overlooking and overshadowing impacts, overpopulation of the area and construction impacts, including noise and waste. Council has concerns over the proposal for this site in relation to its inability to respond to existing neighbourhood character, uh, in particular, a lack of building separation at both ground and first floor, leading to a bulky appearance and a lack of appropriate articulation, which is both a characteristic of the zone and immediate area. The proposed boundary to boundary construction to the rear of the site fails to provide visual break and a sense of openness as encouraged by council policy. This continuous built form again limits landscaping opportunities, leading to an inability to soften the transition between existing dwellings, exac exacerbating the bulky nature of the proposal. There exists a significant lack of dwelling identity to dwelling two, and is again resulting from the continuous built form in which little of the building, excluding the immediate ed entrance, is visible from the internal access way. Further concerns are raised over parking locations. The shared garage for dwellings one and two is not considered secure with ownership concerns a likely issue after subdivision and no proposed rear access to dwelling, to dwelling one uh, from the garage is inconvenient. Other concerns relate to energy efficiency with a lack of north facing living spaces, overshadowing to existing neighbouring solar panels, accessibility and lack of dwelling diversity. It is these reasons uh, of which officers' recommendations for this application is that they refused. The proposal fails to appropriately respond to the requirements of the Wooksley Planning Scheme, in particular of Clause 55 Res Code and Council's Local Policy Clause 16.01-1L, Housing Supply and Established Areas, while also not achieving the key design principles of suburban change areas as sought by the Wooksley Housing Diversity Strategy. Thank you very much, Mr. Yule. And again, um, that was an excellent summary of this particular uh, report and the officer recommendations. Uh, administrators, do you have any questions in relation to this item? No, Chair. No. Uh, in that case, I'm happy to move the officer recommendation for item 5.2.2. Uh, do I have a seconder? Mr. Eddy, thank you. Uh, look, from my perspective, given that excellent, excellent summary of the reasons that officers are recommending refusal, I don't think that there really is a lot further to say. I think Mr. Yule has clearly outlined and the report summarises incredibly well uh, the very significant non-compliance in relation to the Little Sea Planning Scheme, neighbourhood character, residential policy, and particularly those elements of visual bulk, lack of built form separation, lack of appropriate landscaping, and it goes on and it goes on. So I haven't got anything further to say. Uh, Mr. Eddy? Uh, not too much to add to that, Chair. Uh, agree, this has been a very thorough assessment. Note a number of objections were received. I note that concerns were raised directly with the applicant. I suspect given the number of crosses and the relatively mm. low number of ticks, that it's a bit of a back to the drawing board exercise for the applicant to meet the requirements of, of the relevant policies. So I'm very happy to support the recommendation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Eddy. Um, I think I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you. Um, item 5.2.3, Planning Scheme Amendment C256, Interim Heritage Overlay on 90 and 100 Bintz Road, Willert exhibition outcomes and next steps. And again, Mr. Omara, if you'd like to introduce this um, report. Thank you, Chair. I would like to introduce the author of this report, Jane Maynard, strategic planner, who will provide an overview of the report and recommendations. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Omara, and thank you, Chair. I present to you this evening the report for planning scheme amendment C256, Interim Heritage Overlay for 90 Vince Road, Wallert, and Amendment C245, Heritage Overlay for 90 and 100 Vince Road. I'm presenting the, on the outcomes of the statutory exhibition for Amendment C245, which seeks to apply the heritage overlay on a permanent basis to 90 Vince Road and to correct an identification error on, in the existing heritage overlay that applies to 100 Vince Road. 
The report also addresses Amendment C256, which is an existing interim heritage overlay at 90 Vince Road that is due to expire in January 2022. Amendment C245 for the permanent heritage controls went on statutory exhibition between January and March 2021, and two submissions were received. A submission from the Department of Transport opposed the heritage overlay being applied to a section of land already affected by a public acquisition overlay for the out future outer metropolitan ring road. After seeking expert heritage advice, officers recommended the overlay be removed from the public acquisition overlay as shown in attachment two of the report, which will resolve the submission. The other submission was on behalf of the landowner of both sites and sought to reduce the proposed heritage overlay further, limiting it to the general area of the farmhouse and outbuildings. Officers are still in negotiation on this submission as expert heritage advice does not support any further reduction to the overlay. There's still an opportunity to resolve the submission, although more time is needed to allow negotiations to advance. In the meantime, Amendment C256, an interim heritage overlay, which was put in place to allow the permanent controls to be progressed, is due to expire in January 2022. It is important that interim heritage controls don't expire and the heritage significance of the, of the site is protected. The officer recommendation, therefore, is to, to extend the interim controls for a further 12 months to allow more time for negotiations to be conducted and completed. Officers have discussed the matter with Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, who have indicated in principle support to an extension of the interim controls. It is therefore recommended that Council rec uh, resolve to request an extension to, the, to Amendment C256, Interim Heritage Overlay, and authorise Council officers to continue negotiating with the submitter to resolve the submission to Amendment C245 for the permanent controls. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms Maynard. Uh, any questions um, of uh, administrators? Mr Eddy. Uh, just to follow up, please, Chair, if our negotiations with the submitter in relation to Amendment C245 uh, aren't successful in resolving the issue, what happens after that? Mr Omara is desperate to answer, I think. Mr Omara. Thank, thank you, Administrator Edding, through you, Chair. Look, if that, if that scenario eventuates, we will be um, recommending to Council that um, we request the Minister for Planning to appoint an independent panel to consider that submission to the, um, to the planning scheme. So in that instance, a, a panel hearing would be undertaken and recommendations made. And if I may follow up, is there a time frame or a time limit on those negotiations needing yeah. to be resolved? Yeah, most definitely. So um, you might have noted in the report, there's also an active planning permit application at the moment for this site as well. And that's the reason why we are, officers are hopeful that we will be able to resolve this submission because that planning permit application once resolved will actually um, inform the end outcome for this important heritage listed site. So um, we're hopeful that within the next three to six months, we'll have a clear outcome as to whether or not the, the submitter is um, is happy with the outcome, and, we're, and as is council and our, and our heritage experts. Um, so I'd expect within six months' time, we'll have a, um, a way forward um, that we'll be able to inform council of. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? No, no, thanks, Chair. So do I then have a mover for the officer recommendation for item 5.2.3? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Eddy, and a seconder? Yes, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. Uh, Mr. Eddy, would you like to speak to the item? Very briefly, Chair, as we've heard from our officers, it's important that those interim heritage overlay conditions don't expire, hence the first part of the recommendation to request the Minister to extend that overlay as it's about to expire. Um, we note that officers will continue to negotiate on that outstanding submission, uh, which could take some time, as Mr O'Mara has described. So I think this is fairly procedural in that sense and happy to support it. Thank you, Mr Eddy. Anything further, Ms Duncan? No, thank you, Chair. I'll put the item to a vote. 
All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Maynard. Uh, item 5.2.4, Granite Hills Major Community Park. Uh, and again, if I could invite Ms Debbie Wood to um, present on this item. Thank you, Chair. It's my pleasure to present such an exciting project like that the Granite Hills Major Community Park is. These spaces, when developed, are such loved and valued spaces by our community, adults and children alike. Uh, and we've had some fantastic community feedback and engagement um, for the work that we went out with. Um, but I would like to hand over to um, Adrian Napoloni, our um, team leader of Public Realm and Development, just to talk you through the report. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Ms Wood. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Chair. The report recommends that Council support the recommendation of the Granite Hills Major Community Park Community Consultation findings and support the recommendation of the business case for the Granite Hills Major Community Park. Granite Hills Major Community Park is located within Quarry Hills Regional Parkland in South, South Morang and borders Mernda. The parkland is one of the, the parkland is one of um, sorry. The parkland is one of, the, one of the defining landscape features of the municipality and contributes significantly to the character of the city's growth suburbs. The Granite Hills Major Community Park will provide a new park and major space and act as the gateway to the broader Quarry Hills Regional Parkland from the Mernda Corridor. The purpose of the community consultation and engagement was to ensure the design of the park is responsive and reflective of the ancient and modern cultural identity of the site and confirm the type of play style and facilities the community would prefer in the final design. The community engagement process helped council identify and build a picture of the unique cultural identity of the site, including themes, stories, cultural practice, and individual characteristics associated with it. In summary, there was strong support for the concept landscape plan, and just under 70% of participants are happy with the overall design and their favorite elements included public toilets, the flying fox, hill to hill trail, nature play areas, water play, uh, and slide mountain. People currently visit the site to walk, run, and hike. They enjoy accessing Quarry Hills because of the habitat, natural environment, and scenic lookouts. It is important for users to continue to have walking paths, but to also have supporting facilities such as public toilets and play equipment, which broadens the use and allows for longer stays in our parklands. And there is strong support for play equipment shown in the concept design, and 90% 97% of participants believe that the implementation of Granite Hills Park will attract people to visit the area. Once constructed, 95% of participants advised they will use the proposed connecting trails, the proposed connecting trails to the broader Quarry Hills Regional Parkland. Council officers wanted to thank all the community members who provided feedback, especially through a period where face-to-face -face consultation proved to be extremely difficult. The next step is to incorporate the community's feedback into the final Granite Hills Community Park design and continue with the delivery of the project in accordance with option 1B of the business case, which includes design and construction of the regional scale playground with giant slide attractor to meet the functional uh, brief requirements, um, provide spaces for small and large scale community events, including in large irrigated lawns, large shelters, barbecues and picnic facilities, public toilets with changing places facilities, wetland or sustainable water treatments, and an enhanced access road and service utility infrastructure, including wider access roads and deeper road pavements to, pro to promote and support the future Quarry Hills Regional Parkland uses. The Granite Hills Major Community Park was successful in receiving $2.5 million grant funding from the state government's Growing Suburbs Fund, and a key milestone of this grant is to commence construction of the project in October, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Napoleone. Uh, administrators, any questions? Mr. Eddy? Oh, sorry, I'm Ms. Happy, Duncan, over I'm to you first. To <laughs> um, this is probably to uh, Ms. Wood. Can you please confirm that as part of this redevelopment, this is also that the Quarry Hills Regional Park is also the proposed location for the Aboriginal gathering place? Yes through you, Chair. Um, that's correct. The, the location of the playground is at the bottom of the hill and, you, and there's, a, um, there's a road that leads up to the hill, which is where the Aboriginal gathering space is. So it's, a, it's, it's in close proximity and the, the same 
Quarry Hill Park. Great, thank you. Mr. Eddy. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to clarify something. I believe Mr. Napoleone uh, mentioned option 1B as the business case option we're supporting tonight. The report specifically says on page 92, option 2B is the recommended option. So I'd just like to be clear on what is the recommended option and, and, and I'd like to suggest that perhaps we be specific about that in the resolution that we make tonight. Ms Wood, would you like to cl clarify or Mr Napoleone? Oh, yeah, I'll let, um, I'll let Adrian clarify. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, absolutely correct. On page 170 of the report, it does state under the business case option 2B, but that is, a, uh, that is an error. The recommendation of the council officers is option 1B, which is stated in the recommendation of the report. Okay. Um, Chair, the recommendation that I'm seeing doesn't actually say which option. So I'm wondering whether mm. we should include that specifically so that it's very clear what we're moving mm. forward with here. Could I, uh, are there any other questions, administrators, that you have? Or are we at a point that we're ready to move the officer recommendations? No more questions from me, Chair. Okay. None from me either, Chair. So I wonder if um, one of you would like to move the um, officer recommendation for item 5.2.4 with whatever amendment you would like to include within it. It's obviously with the inclusion of the option within the recommendation, Ms Duncan. Yes, or Chair, Mr. I'm, happy, I'm happy to move this item with that added um, recommendation as point three or can I, no, can I suggest if, if I may administrator Duncan that we would simply need to add into item two yep. support the recommendation for option 1b, 1B. that's right case, yep. as outlined that's in this report or something yep. to that effect yeah so Ms Duncan are you happy to move the officer recommendation with that um, amendment to part two Yes, Chair. And Thank I'm happy you. to second that, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Eddy. Um, Ms. Duncan, would you like to speak to the to the officer recommendation and the item? Um, yes, Chair. I think we can remove that slide now. Thanks. Um, I think this is a fantastic um, initiative that we're doing, and the extensive consultation we did with the community so that we really target in on what the needs are. And then um, as Ms Wood has confirmed to also have the gathering place at this site, but away from the playground, obviously, I think this is going to be a phenomenal area for people to go and, and do all sorts of things in the parklands and flying foxes and, um, and abilities, water play and the giant slides and things like that. It just gives our residents another opportunity to be outside health and wellbeing with their families and friends coming from everywhere. Um, it just gives them that another opportunity to really make use of the facilities in our community. Um, I, I commend the officers on the widespread consultation. I think that was um, very well done and I can't wait for this construction to start in October next year. It's a very exciting initiative. And it is a beautiful place as well. So we've, we've picked a very good spot to do something like this. So I can't wait to see that next year. And it's a unique opportunity for our local residents. And as I said, any visitors to the city or their family and friends that may be coming from outside of um, the city of Whittlesea. So well done to all. Thank you, Ms Duncan. Mr Eddy. Thank you, Chair. To paraphrase a colleague, I think Administrator Duncan has summed it up nicely. Nothing further to add. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I would just like to make a very, very brief comment of, again, acknowledgement, as Mr Napoleone did, of the community comments that we've got in. There's some really rich comments, and uh, I, I think it's really fantastic that despite 
the COVID-19 restrictions that we've um, in general got such wonderful community feedback and how well loved obviously Quarry Hills is uh, right across the municipality. Um, so that was number one, but my second um, acknowledgement is to again our council officers. I think this is another example of genuine community consultation and listening to community views and obviously there's some real sensitivities for our residents associated with Quarry Hills Park. Uh, it's a very significant regional parkland and, and has got some environmental sensitivities. Uh, and also congratulations on securing that $2.5 million of government funding. So please pass on to your team, um, well, to Ms Wood and Mr Napoleone and the other officers, uh, our congratulations for a really good outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, I note that there are no notices of motion. Administrators, are there any items of urgent business? No, Chair. No, Chair. And I have none as well. Uh, so we might move on then to reports of council representatives and the CEO update. Uh, and Ms Duncan, if I could hand over to you to provide an update to both the council and members of the public of um, activities over the past month. Thank you, Chair. As I usually say, there'll be some that we've all attended together, so <laughs> I'll pick, get the ball rolling. Um, I attended the, VG, the VLGA annual general meeting on the 18th of November, which was wonderful to be a part of. I also had the Whittlesea Reconciliation Group meeting on the 25th of November. And again, that was quite productive with um, the opportunity to get organised for in the new year to have a planning day around what the events calendar and those things will look like coming into 2022. And hopefully we'll be able to do some of the events in person next year, which we haven't been able to do this year. I had the absolute privilege and honour to um, lay the wreath at, for um, Remembrance Day at the Epping RSL. And I'd just like to thank everyone at the RSL for having me there. It was absolutely delightful and I feel very honoured to have been there. And it was a very lovely ceremony. Um, and I also attended the Creeds Farm Annual General Meeting on the 16th of November. And then last week, I had the privilege of uh, stepping in for you, Chair, um, to launch the um, Lifelong Learning Program at Olivine Place and Price. And what a fantastic facility that is. It's just amazing. And that was done in partnership with Novak and Price. And I think we can be very, very proud of that facility and the community will get some fantastic use from it. There's a social enterprise coffee shop that make a wonderful coffee, a gorgeous pop-up library from um, Yarra Plenty Ranges, um, and it was just an, a magnificent event. And I also attended three citizenship ceremonies as well um, to welcome our new um, Australian citizens to, to be now a citizen, but also um, into our city of Whittlesea as an Australian resident now. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Duncan. <clears throat> Administrator Eddie, have you got any questions of Ms Duncan? I have so many, Chair, <laughs> so many, but no, no questions. So I will hand over to you then to also provide an update on activities over the past month. Thank you, Chair. Administrator Duncan puts me to shame, I think, with that list of events and uh, duties that she's performed this last uh, month. I still feel like I'm, I'm being uh, wrapped up in cotton wool with, uh, with COVID and, and home uh, meetings, but there's a few highlights that uh, are worth mentioning. Uh, I did attend on behalf of you all, the NGAA's election advocacy priorities announcement, which was uh, good to see the focus that that, that that alliance is putting on advocating for issues that affect not just us, but all growth areas around the country as we're coming into, as, as we're aware, a federal election period. That information is available online and it's worth a look 
if anyone wants to see uh, what those key issues are at the moment. Uh, with you, Chair, I attended the Audit and Risk Committee meeting recently with our two new independent members. I'm sure you may speak about this. I'll just simply say they've hit the ground running and are adding value from, from the start, which was great uh, to see. And then uh, last week, we had our second meeting of the Business Advisory Panel, which I was able to join uh, virtually, but I noticed they were all present in the room, which was good, good to see at Quest in Epping. Some terrific presentations, including one from the uh, the executive director of the Hume Whittlesey Len, uh, what inspiring work they are doing. The uh, overview we saw of the excellent work they're doing to help young people uh, find employment pathways and further their uh, their opportunities is is just inspiring. I thought that was fabulous, and there were some other terrific speakers, and I think some great engagement between the panel members and those speakers, which bodes well, I think, for for what we'll get in terms of value out of that new group, the business advisory panel. So th they're my highlights, uh, Madam Chair. Happy to leave it at that and answer any questions. Thank you. Ms Duncan, do you have any questions of Mr Eddy? Many, many questions, Chair, <laughs> but I'll, I'll leave it perhaps to the next meeting. Thank you, and I have no questions. Um, but if I could just provide a very brief update myself and um, commence by um, thanking my colleagues for actually attending a number of really important civic and other events on my uh, behalf over the past four weeks. So thank you both for your support. Uh, I um, attended the board meeting of Little Sea Community Connections on the 15th of November, and along with my colleagues attended the Victorian Local Governance Association annual general meeting, which was absolutely fantastic with Peggy O'Neill as the guest speaker. Uh, as um, Administrator Eddie indicated, uh, we had the City of Whittlesea Audit and Risk Committee and probably the only comment I would make is that we have got the two new independent members who have got amazing complementary skills and abilities. Uh, so it's a, a wonderful mix of people on that um, audit committee uh, alongside our um, really exceptional chair, Mr Jeff Harry, who... Uh, does a wonderful job of chairing, uh, particularly given that we have exhaustive uh, agendas. Uh, I'm also really pleased to note that I attended on behalf of the Interface Group of Councils a briefing with the Honourable Tim Pallas, who's obviously the Treasurer, Minister for Economic Development and Minister for Industrial Relations, and that was alongside our Chief Executive Officer, uh, so we were really pleased to be nominated and accepted to attend that session. And then on the 24th of November, again representing the Interface Group of Councils, I attended a briefing with the Honourable James Molino, Deputy Premier, uh, again uh, in relation to particular issues for Interface Group of Councils, uh, particularly relating to his specific portfolio. Uh, and then the other key highlight, and it has already been commented on by my colleagues, is the great pleasure to be presiding over the citizenship ceremonies. So we had five sessions uh, on the 11th of November and the 23rd of November, and it was a great honour to preside uh, over our um, citizenship ceremonies online and the great hope that we will, in the new year, uh, be having those ceremonies in person. So really looking forward to that. Again, happy to respond to any questions that my colleagues might have of me. No? Okay. Uh, if, if not, I will now ask uh, the CEO if he would also provide an update to council and to the community uh, in relation to particular issues or activities. Thank you, Chair. So I've been out and about a lot in the last uh, few weeks, and it's great to see things really starting to open up and that sense of normality uh, starting to, to return. Uh, I also had the opportunity to lay the reef at the Remembrance Day service, this time in Doreen. Uh, and thank you in particular to our friends at the Doreen RSL for holding that event and the large number of community members and school children that attended. 
Uh, this Friday night, we have our annual Carols by Candlelight event, and we're absolutely thrilled to have an in-person event this time at the Terrace Lawns at the Civic Centre. It's our first large event back uh, in a very long time. Uh, tickets are free, and they can be secured online on our website at arts.wittlesea.vic.gov.au. And if you're not able to join us in person, you will be able to watch the show, which will be live streamed on Council's YouTube channel. There's been a lot of conversations about grass in our community recently. We're continuing to work closely with our contractors to ensure our municipality is looking well maintained. And this is it included revising the mowing frequency and schedules. There are also additional crews and staff on deck now and working longer hours, including on the weekends to catch up. But to be clear, I'm not satisfied with the management of the presentation of our parks and gardens and grass areas and a considerable effort has been made by our officers to ensure that our contractors both rectify this issue and ensure that our community does not see a repeat into the future. Last week, we saw the great news that the city of Whittlesea had reached 90% double vaccination of its population aged 15 and over. Fantastic result and it's testament to the work that's been happening around the city to ensure our community uh, can access the COVID vaccination easily close to home uh, and in fact we've had 10 local pop-up clinics that's just in November alone. We've run 93 community engagement activities in November and a big thank you to our team of staff who've also partnered with the Whittlesea Community Connections uh, multilingual health navigators to run COVID-19 information booths at local shopping centres. We've had three booths running seven days a week during November and they've been helping people access vaccinations or boosters or helping them get their vaccination certificates uh, online. Our team have also partnered with local agencies to provide food and material support to people isolating due to COVID. And, and to date, we've supported 640 households and around 2,466 2, residents with food. As a result of that really high local vaccination rate, the Northern Health has now closed its vaccine centre at the Prack building. The centre was opened in June when the local vaccination rates were well below the state average. And we've been really proud to work with the Victorian Government and DPV Health initially, and then followed by Northern Health to support that max, mass, mass vaccination site. Now that the high vaccination rates are there, it's time to return Prack to its community use. And we look forward to seeing everyone back enjoying the entertainment at Prack next year. And bookings for the Prack building will be opening again early in 2022. With the nicer weather now, it's a great opportunity to head out and see some of the new facilities around the municipality. The new splash pad at the Whittlesea Swim Centre is now open and the water play zone is lots of fun for the family, a tipping bucket, umbrella, water sprayers and more. Uh, I had the whole opportunity to visit there last week and it was fantastic. If you haven't been up to the Whittlesea Swim Centre uh, for a while, make sure you head out there this summer. Families can also enjoy the newly upgraded Darabin Creek Parklands on Dalton Road in Epping. There's brand new play equipment, uh, a fitness station and a new picnic shelter there to enjoy. And the All Abilities play space at Mill Park Recreation Reserve is always very popular. Uh, and we've just started construction on a temporary gravel overflow parking area to help cope with the demand there. We, ex we expect to be completed before Christmas. We're also working on a more permanent parking expansion for that location. As we're heading into Christmas period, it's a great opportunity to support local businesses. So don't forget the local traders as you do your Christmas shopping and our Dine Outside campaign is highlighting the benefits of enjoying local restaurants and cafes now that the weather has improved and we can all enjoy eating out so much more. The city of Whittlesea has so much to enjoy and explore, so let's throw our support behind those in the community and those businesses that have been doing it tough. While council meetings will be taking a break until the end of January, our staff will be continuing to work hard to deliver our community plan actions and quite a few of our staff will be working right through the Christmas and New Year period to make sure that our vital services are continuing to be delivered to the community during that time. And on behalf of our staff, I would like to take this opportunity to wish our administrators and our community a very happy Christmas and a happy New Year. Thank you, Chair.
Thank you very much, Mr. Lloyd. And clearly you've had an exceptionally busy past month and um, we acknowledge all the exhaustive efforts of yourself and your team. Uh, so thank you also. And could I just note that uh, Ms. Duncan and myself will also be attending the annual Carols by Candlelight this Friday evening. Uh, administrators, do you have any questions of Mr. Lloyd? No, Chair. No, Chair. Thank you. Thank you uh, again, Mr. Lloyd. And I note that all of our verbal reports will be documented in summary form in the minutes. So, administrators, I now require a motion to close the meeting to the public under Section 662A of the Local Government Act 2020 for consideration of two confidential items. Item um, uh, number 9.1.1, kindergarten reform option paper, and item number 9.2.1, compulsory land acquisition. Were you jumping the gun, Administrator Eddie? to move to close the meeting for consideration of confidential items. I, I'm sure I was just clearing my throat, but so moved. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Eddy. Uh, do I have a seconder? I'll jump in there, Chair. I'll second that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. I'll put that item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. So that brings us to the end of the open meeting. But I do think it's important, as Mr Lloyd reflected, that just before we close the meeting, that we do provide a very short Christmas message as well. Um, so my message for 2022 is really quite a simple message, which is um, to our staff, but also to our community to be confident and excited and optimistic about the year ahead. And that even though things have been really uncertain and unknown over the past year, this shouldn't stop us at all from being hopeful and planning for the future, both near and far. Uh, Ms Duncan. Um, thank you, Chair. Those are very nice words. I, I think um, wishing everyone a happy, happy festive season, um, whatever that means for you in our diverse community. And I think in 2022, it will be actually really good to see our community reconnecting together. Um, I think that's really important. And over the last two years, really, if, even though we're out of restrictions now, but it's, let's say two years, um, I think it's been challenging and I just look forward to everyone reconnecting in our community um, and coming back together and supporting our local businesses um, and all of our people in the community and helping each other. And, uh, yeah, just very much looking forward to seeing lots of smiling faces as we tour around the uh, city of Whittlesea, which we will be doing early next year. Thank you, Ms Duncan. Mr Eddie? Oh, that was really sweet from Administrator Duncan. I'm not sure I can improve on it. I echo <laughs> all of that. Uh, positive thoughts, uh, safe and happy um, Christmas, New Year, festive season, whatever you want to call it for, for the community. And let's strive to have a better normal rather than a new normal next year. Thank you, Administrators. Thank you to our wonderful diverse community and also to our wonderful staff. Uh, who have worked tirelessly on behalf of the community over the past year. Uh, and on that note, I now declare the open meeting uh, closed. Thank you all. <laughs>